Um, my name is Jason Steinhauer. I'm the director of the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest here at Villanova University. Thank you guys for, so much for spending an evening with us. Uh, I'm going to do a couple of sort of obligatory administrative announcements and uh, sort of set the mood for our conversation tonight. And then I'll turn it over to Chris and our distinguished panelists to get us started. Uh, but a couple things. First of all, um, cell phones. Probably all have them. Uh, don't turn them off because uh, we are tweeting this event, we're live tweeting this event at the hashtag LePage at VU. So um, feel free to use your cell phone during the event, but please put it to silent. Uh, that way it doesn't ring or it doesn't vibrate or it doesn't chime or anything else uh, during the event just so not to disturb the speakers or the proceedings. Um, this year at the, this academic year at the LePage Center, we've been focusing uh, primarily on the issue topic of democracy. Um, you know, there's, there's been questions uh, both here in the United States and abroad uh, about democracy, its nature, its composition, whether it's imperiled or not. And uh, we kind of felt as part of our contribution to this conversation, uh, we could sort of think about democracy in more of a historical perspective. And in the fall, we did a two-part conversation series actually called Histories of Democracy. And I think what we learned from that series is that um, democracy means different things to different people in different contexts. Uh, we had Joanne Freeman here, who's a historian of early America, talking about how, uh, as she put it, among the founder folk of the United States, uh, democracy was not actually perceived to be a very positive thing. In fact, it was perceived to be a dangerous thing. Um, and uh, certain people were uh, envisioned to participate in that democracy, and certain people were not envisioned to participate in that democracy. Um, that theme of sort of inclusion and exclusion was sort of uh, a, a theme that we followed throughout that conversation thread. And who participates in our democracy uh, has evolved over time. Our second event on democracy in the fall expanded that conversation to a more global perspective. And you know, we heard from scholars and experts on our panel that democracy in the Czech Republic is not the same as democracy in the former Soviet republics, which is not the same as democracy in the Middle East, which is not the same as democracy in Latin America and other places. So I think it forced us to think about democracy as sort of an evolving term. And uh, one of our panelists uh, quoted Václav Havel in his address to US Congress talking about democracy is not something that we, we have at the moment, it's something we aspire to, it's, it's, it's something that we achieve towards. And in that spirit, I think democracy, at least in my mind, is not only a noun, but it's also a verb, we democracy. And so this semester, we're thinking about how we participate in the democracy. Right? And that is the impetus for our two-part conversation that we're having today and in a couple weeks from now. One of the ways that we participate in democracy is through activism and making our voices heard. And of course, we're living through a political moment right now with lots of political activity. We just saw the climate strike which happened on Friday where tens of thousands of students were protesting for action on climate change. Obviously, the Women's March has been a seismic event in American politics. Millions of people have participated in that. So it's a good moment to think about how we participate in democracy and how we place that participation within historical contexts. How we think about participation in democracy in the past, how we think about it today, how those two things are connected. So that is what our conversation today will uh, dive into. I think there's lots of ripe territory for us. And because we are thinking about participation and democracy, it didn't feel right for us to do a panel where we just assembled a bunch of experts, had them talk for 45 minutes, and then people got to ask a couple questions at the end. Tonight, you guys are part of the conversation. You are part of the event, which is why the house lights are up. And so you are part of the dialogue, and you are going to be shaping the conversation. As you walked in, you may have seen uh, some quotations and some ideas that have already come in around the question of activism and its role in democracy. And we're going to be asking more of those questions uh, throughout the course of the evening. And we are in very capable hands because we are incredibly fortunate to have Chris Satullo here, uh, formerly of WHYY and The Inquirer. And he has experience leading these types of unpanels, which we are calling this event tonight. And so very uh, shortly after I'm done uh, giving my intro spiel, I'll turn it over to Chris, and he will get us all engaged in this conversation. 
I will say uh, that it is a conversation, and part of what we try to do at the LePage Center is, is create spaces for conversations that are historically informed, as well as civic-minded. And in that spirit, I'll just uh, throw out a brief reminder that uh, we want to keep the conversation uh, respectful and civil. We want to learn from each other. We want to hear people's ideas. Uh, you may hear things that you disagree with. You may hear ideas that run counter to your own experiences or the ways that you understand certain things. But tonight is an opportunity for us to listen and learn from each other. And I'm looking forward to that uh, learning process with all of you. Our excellent speakers here will help us kick off the conversation. Their bios are flashing on the screen. Uh, part of our uh, commitment to the environment here at the LePage Center is that we do not print out event programs or event flyers that invariably wind up in the trash or in the recycle bin. Uh, so the event uh, personalities are here, their bios are on the screen, and of course you can look up on your smartphone to look, find more information about each of our amazing speakers and experts. And finally, I just want to thank and acknowledge all the people that help make events like this possible. It is a large undertaking. Our faculty director, Paul Steggy, is here, did an enormous amount of work helping making this event possible. Uh, the dean, Adele Lindemeyer, for her support. The chair of the history department, Mark Galicchio, for his support. Our friends, our advisory council members who are here, and of course, all of you. And a special uh, recognition to Jenny Waldman, who is the admin and program specialist at the LePage Center, who has made sure that all of these speakers are here, and their trains arrived on time, and that we have microphones, and that we have stools, and that you are all sitting here. She's really an incredible addition to the LePage Center team, and uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have her. So um, I think those are all of my introductory comments, and without further ado, Chris, please shepherd us through the unpanel. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, good to be with you all tonight. Uh, the Unpanel is a format that we've developed at the Penn Project for Civic Engagement, where I'm the uh, co-director over the last few years. Tried it frequently when I was at WHYY, so here's the deal. Um, we're going to start out um, asking our panelists each to spend about five minutes, that would be five minutes, uh, giving us some food for thought. And they've got basically two possible um, prompts that they can respond to. One, uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, in an advanced phone call. The idea is there's some lesson or caveat or model um, from their research or their expertise in activism um, that they would like to offer up to today's activists as something useful for them to ponder. Or they've all seen the things that you wrote in um, when you registered for the event, and they have the freedom to respond to those, and it, in any one of those if they want to. So we're going to do that to give you, uh, to give us sort of a grounding and some things to think and talk about. Um, then the conversation gets thrown out to you. Um, what we're going to ask you to do is gather in small groups. Five is probably a good number. Just if you simply turn around, some of you, you can sort of form the groups. You guys are a nice group over there. And talk a little bit about what you heard, uh, what questions it raises for you, what observations you'd like to make. The panelists and I will wander around, join in the conversations, listen in for a while. We'll do that for about 20 minutes. Then we'll all come back up here, talk a little bit about what we heard. And then if any of you would like to offer either a question or observation, you'll notice that there's an empty chair up there. So one brave person, I'm sure, will be willing to go there first. And then anybody else who wants to come up and join the conversation, that's the on-deck circle right there, that chair. And um, when it's time for the person who's up there um, to go back and sit down because they've started boring us, I will you know, gently suggest that somebody else replace them. OK, you got that? That's the uh, format. We've used it many times. And it creates an opportunity to definitely benefit from and engage with the expertise and the intellect and the, the scholarship that's represented up on the stage, but gives you a chance to contribute your own thoughts in a productive way. So without further ado, let us begin the unpanel. And Natalie, for no reason other than you're looking at me right now, you've, you've drawn the short straw. You get to go first. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, so Chris told us about our two possible prompts. I'll sort of combine them in my response to you. So the first thing he asked about what are, what's one or two lessons from your research for today's activists. Um, I would say two things. Uh, first of all is uh, to try to harness the power of media. Um, ideally television media, if you can get that. Uh, but obviously we've had other social movements and other kinds of activism that have been uh, 
have successfully used, uh, for example, print media, newspapers, so forth, things like that. Um, but television media is really unrivaled, I think, in terms of the sort of attention it can capture. Uh, if I'm thinking of maybe, uh, I mean, certainly the traditional civil rights movement did a great job capturing television media in one of uh, the earliest sort of uses of uh, broadcast television. And it's sort of more difficult these days now that uh, people have uh, different channels to watch and you don't just have to watch what's on these three news channels and you can watch various other things. Um, but I still think that television media has a pretty strong hold um, on what uh, people um, think about as being an important issue and in terms of agenda setting for political institutions and, and things like that. Um, so in, in order to sort of combine it with uh, some of the things that people were saying in these prompts uh, responses, uh, somebody made a point basically about activism helping to determine what people in political power think is important, and that's sort of refers to what I was saying earlier about the importance of agenda setting, right? People think things are important that they hear about all the time. Um, and this people in uh, political office, you know, think of these things as being important too, and whether their constituents actually call them or not, uh, these are sort of like the big issues that people end up talking about. And so getting something on television or in the news is really important to help set the agenda of what um, a, uh, an elected official might be thinking about, what sort of bills get introduced. I know Dan Gillian, who's a political science professor at Penn, did some sort of quantitative research that indicated that this is, um, in some situations, at least actually uh, empirically true. Um, that uh, at least in black protest movements particularly was his research, that um, these protest movements actually do make a difference in terms of what ends up getting on political agendas in terms of what bills get passed in other areas of government as well. Um, so that would be my opening gambit. Okay, let me break the rules already if and ask you <laughs> sure. a, a follow-up question. Um, there, from Tahrir Square on, there's been a lot of talk about how social media um, was going to become a more powerful tool because that's a way to elude or get around or ignore the gatekeepers. Television, obviously, even with the proliferation of cable channels, still has gatekeepers. So how do you feel about you? Do you still think television is dominant? I mean, yeah, I do. I mean, social media definitely is another avenue that people um, participate in activism. I, I'm not saying it's not important. It's definitely important. These things go viral. People um, get this information. But a lot of the time, it, I mean, it still goes, goes viral through a video camera usually, right? Uh, there's still a videoing effect that's happening um, here. And I think in terms of, um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of people who aren't on social media. For younger people, certainly, I think social media is more important. But there's certainly a lot of older people um, who are you know, more likely to vote, for example, who aren't necessarily participating or maybe aren't participating as actively as younger people. Um, or, you know, maybe they find out about something that went viral on social media later when they hear about it on television. Um, and uh, certainly the president thinks television is very important. <laughs> uh, not that I'm necessarily endorsing those practices, but I, uh, there's a large segment of the country who primarily watches television, I think, to get their news at least more than, than social media. So I, I think both things are pretty important. Thank you. Shamia? Hi, so I come here to you as an activist and also a literary activist. I run the Feminist Press, and we are the longest running feminist publisher in the world. We've been lit since 1970, so we light up movements and also literature with feminist books. And for me, I just think so much about Frederick Douglass, and I think about the wisdom of power conceding nothing without demand being what drives me in this moment um, I'm really interested in you proving that centrists are not wimps because I definitely would say that I'm someone who believes at like being on the edge of pushing people's comfort forward. I think centrists have their place and I think that I represent um, a sort of insurgent, emergent type personality that also needs to exist within movements and within political uh, conversations to have vision for what is possible, to drive it and to be the person people think is a little bit crazy to imagine something different, to push it, and to know it's gonna happen and drive it forth with what some people might say is naivete, some people might say is recklessness, and what others might say later is liberation. And I see that as the daughter and granddaughter of civil rights activists and people who taught me that they had to fight in order for me to be here right now to be able to speak, and that it's my duty the rent that I paid living on this earth to make sure that until all people are free that I will put my body, my voice, and my works on the line for others. Because if you're not free, I'm not free. 
Throughout history, I've seen my people be oppressed. I have seen them be depressed, and I have seen every effort made to hamper our survival, and that is ungodly. I like that I'm in this institution as a person of faith, and I believe that it's the moral imperative of people of conscience to fight forward and to move power and to speak truth to power as if our lives depend on it, because they do. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, the struggles that you're talking about, I think at least in retrospect, we can see were bright line moral struggles that wouldn't, where movement would not have occurred without the kind of activism you're talking about. Does it ever annoy you when other causes grasp the mantle and claim the same urgency that the civil rights movement had? I love that question. I've written about it, actually, this idea of movement appropriation, um, the idea of, uh, you know, people taking another movement and co-opting it in order to gain profit, right? And there's a whole other conversation about whether there can be ethical consumption within capitalism, which I do not agree with, which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> but I feel that that also happens with movements. And I have sort of what some in my view and my movements would think is a more centrist view about this, because I do consider myself to be a Southern pragmatist because of the kind of activists that I came from. Um, which is that I do believe sometimes that in order to move the needle with people who may not be as left as I am of something on center, that it's okay if they are leaning into the movement for with a different theory of change or approach than I have. And if I see that there's strategic import to that, I'm willing to work with that if the core issue is morally intact. And so, for example, I'll make the distinction. I think that people who do not support um, social services for low-income communities of color but would say that Black Lives Matter to push forth an agenda around reproductive rights, I think that that is deeply problematic. But if there are people who say, I personally disagree with certain of the issues that are at the front forefront of conversations about reproductive rights, but I am supporting movements to make sure that there's access to people getting the services they need in their communities. We can have a conversation about the things that we can do together that would move lives forward. I think for me, the, um, the problem with the appropriation is when people use rhetoric in empty ways in order to move forward a political agenda when there's sizzle and no meat behind it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Jerusha. Thank you. Um, so I'm an education researcher, and I focus on student activists and youth organizers through a developmental lens. So I really look at uh, learning environments, both in school and out of school, and how they facilitate the socio-political development of young people. And so as the, the non-historian on the panel, I'll say, um, historically speaking, universities have been very important sites for activism in the US. We can look back to, you know, 1833 and the formation of anti-slavery abolition groups on college campuses um, to 1900 and our neighbor down the street, Bryn Mawr uh, College and the suffrage groups and activism that was happening on that campus. Uh, fast forward to the 1930s and the anti-war organizing that students were engaged in. Of course, the civil rights era and the 1960s, the formation of SNCC at um, Shaw University and the lunch counter sit-ins that, that came thereafter, as well as the Freedom Summer, which recruited heavily from the North college campuses. So all this to say there are countless examples throughout our history of um, very vibrant student protests and student activism. And the activism we're seeing today on college campuses is, is part of that tradition. And one interesting note is we may be actually at a new peak in student activism on college campuses. There's a study out of UCLA that um, surveys freshmen, first, first time, first year college and university students across the country. And the recent report found that freshmen more freshmen have a um, greater intention that they will participate in a demonstration or protest during their four years in college than any previous freshman administration of this survey in, uh, since 1966. Um, so whether or not they act on it, there's the intention that they will be involved. So it's, it's becoming kind of um, 
more normative on college campuses today, but certainly student activism has deep, deep historical roots. Um, there's a man named Mark Boren who's written a book on the unruly subject, and he's, he's traced um, clashes between administrators and student protesters to the 13th century Bologna, Italy, the, the advent of the university. Um, so this tension has you know, long been part of the fabric of campus culture, sometimes more muted, sometimes more visible. Um, but I think it's playing out today in a really interesting way um, because in the last 20 years or so, the university has shifted in a decidedly neoliberal direction despite the, the public mission of higher education. And I think that context raises really interesting um, challenges and constraints for student activism today that we can, we can talk about. Um, so as we, as we think about moving into this unpanel, I want to uh, raise a question or, or surface a problem for you all. So if we, um, on the one hand, accept that activism has a vital role to play in a democracy, because it builds the power of ordinary citizens, especially the most marginalized, to raise their concerns, to make demands, to, um, to counterbalance the power and privilege that of moneyed interests, lobbyists, you know, one percenters who really have co-opted and controlled a lot of our elected officials. If we accept that on the one hand, and if on the other hand we accept that our K-12, K-16 uh, system of public education is a cornerstone of democracy insofar as it's preparing well-informed, actively engaged citizens who will further our democracy. Then what role do these institutions, particularly secondary and tertiary institutions, have to play in fostering student activism? Not in suppressing it, not in consuming it, not in sidelining it and, and redirecting students um, towards more apolitical forms of civic engagement, like days of service or you know, service learning programs. What responsibility, or, or to borrow your language, moral imperative is there for institutions of higher education, public and private, to seed and support student activists, if any? I'd be uh, very curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. If I could ask you one question, too, and this may be coming out of left field, but there was a survey last year, I think it was the Pew Research Center, um, that asked people a question, do you believe democracy is the best form of government? And more than one out of four people under the age of 25 said no, that they simply don't believe in democracy. Um, is, does that strike you as something new, and how does that uh, sort of inform or change the activism that you're seeing? If it's not aimed at democratic, let's get a law passed change. Um, how does that change things? Mm, that's interesting. Um, the, the, I just completed a book project on college student activists, and, and one of my co-researchers is here tonight um, in the audience. And those student activists actually really did support democracy. Yep. They, they wanted their institutions to be more democratic, to represent their interests, to be more accessible, to protect the public good. Um, so they, they saw the problems with capitalism and they saw the problems with democracy, especially as it's um, being bought these days. But they um, wanted to kind of carve out this third space where they could realize the beloved community to, to kind of echo that language from the civil rights. So um, I didn't see a lot of disillusionment with democracy, but um, I don't know if you, if you saw anything different. Okay. <laughs> we'll expect some deep thoughts in about a half an hour. There. Okay, so at this point, this is this is just a conversation starter or a collection of conversations. There's some food for thought. So uh, turn to the people next to you in any way. I'm not going to stage manage this at all. If you have a question for any one of our panelists, wave them over. We'll be walking around, um, just sort of listening in, and we'll keep that up as long as there's energy for it. Okay, but 15 to 20 minutes sounds about right. So. Um, what are your own observations? Uh, was there any part of what you heard that your brain was pushing back against and saying, no, I don't think that's right? Was there something where you're going, amen, sister, whatever it was that um, you were thinking, talk about it with your neighbor, 
and wave a panelist over if you have a question or a comment on something they said. Okay? We're good to go? Thank you. So, was that any fun? Yeah. This should be fun. Democracy should be fun. Okay, first, I want to just start with the panelists, and we'll go in the opposite order. Jerusha, we'll start with you. What did you hear that was interesting? We were having a really lively conversation about um, civic engagement, the lack of activism in the suburbs, the, the different forms that activism can take, um, how to translate activist efforts into votes and voter turnout. Um, yeah, I um, you know, the, the opportunities and challenges which come from single issue movements versus intersectional ones where you're kind of focused on a variety of issues, how do you triage your interests to be effective and impactful but also connect the dots in your analysis and action, how do you um, make certain local issues sexy to get people to turn out and to vote and to um, engage and to participate. Uh, how do you translate one-off activism into movement building and movement making over the course of a career or after you graduate? And also, what kind of lasting impact students make on administration and professors and adults who they impact here when they're in, in university? Of course, as we all know, being a community organizer is not a real job. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Barack Obama would say something differently about that. I have no and so would Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always told people when they said that to me. <laughs> yes. Hi. All right. Uh, well, over on this side of the room, uh, we talked a lot about uh, service learning initiatives in universities. Some people in that group found a lot of value in service learning initiatives. And uh, we also talked about inclusion and diversity efforts that various colleges are engaged in and what is you know, most effective or um, or not, or the different sorts of degrees of effect that those programs have. And then in the back, I talked a lot with uh, some people who pointed out that actually we've mostly discussed um, the context of the United States and the fairly recent United States, and perhaps we could talk about other things, like they were talking about the French Revolution, for example, um, as a uh, totally different um, location, but with a lot of connection, obviously, to what we've talked about in terms of the American context. So we could think more broadly, I guess, geographically and, and in terms of time period as well. Yeah, let's hang on to that. I actually have a question that we talked about before. I'd like to ask you about this. Just a couple of things I heard that were really interesting. Uh, one, one person was saying, one form of activism is when you, it's one-to-one. -one. When you hear something that's wrong, do you let it go? And he was saying, um, the discussion was how uh, fake news, of course, spreads on social media and the most aggressive um, spreaders of fake news might be your grandmother and grandfather <laughs> who fall for stuff and then spread it. And w one guy was saying he's given up trying to correct his grandmother because it just doesn't get him anywhere. So that's a skill. That's a small activist skill that people need to have, how to, how to create change one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and s somebody over here, in response to what you said, Jerusha was saying, one of the most interesting, memorable, and satisfying, though inefficient, courses she ever took was one that was completely student-directed. Was it 12 students in the class, I think? Philosophy? Yeah. Um, and it was hard, and it was messy, and uh, it was unforgettable. But that's a way of, of creating leadership among students. Like, I'm not, I'm not the sage on the stage. You guys figure out how to learn. So, well, can I build on that for a second? Sure. Um, so, in our study of college self-identified college student activists, we looked at when they came to adopt that mantle or that identity, and it, it was about forty-five percent who said they became activists in high school, as opposed to in college. And of those, there were two main drivers of of that turn towards activism. It wasn't service learning courses. It wasn't civics classes. It wasn't student government. What it was was feeling like they had a voice in their classroom. Mm -hmm. And then there was also the power of um, extracurricular programs, community-based organizations. Um, so that's, that's student voice. But I isn't think. that so irritating if you worked hard on your syllabus and your lectures, those irritating <laughs> students who want to say something? <laughs> First, I'm going to take a director's prerogative to just throw a couple of things I heard in our conversations, which I thought were really interesting. We had a nice conversation in the back about environmental activism, and the issue came, or the, the idea came to us 
I'm thinking about this connection between sciences and the humanities, because environmental activism, global change, climate change activism can't exist without the science that tells us what's happening to the planet. And so it's an interesting evolution of research and ideas coming out of the scientific community, scientific activism, and then that migrating into the humanities and other spaces. And so sort of breaking down these barriers between STEM and humanities and showing where those two have you know, organic synergies with each other. We had a great conversation here, uh, and I'll point out this amazing scarf that's being worn in the second row, um, about the artifactual nature of activism. And this scarf, uh, which I would love for her to come up and tell us more about, is actually a, uh, a piece of art that represents some of the signs that were at the Women's March that people were holding up. And um, it got us thinking about the objects of activism. Uh, these pieces that wind up in museums or that wind up in photographs, the faces and the names become anonymous after a while of the actual people. But the signs live on. And it's oftentimes through those artifactual qualities of these protests that we make form ideas about them. And so thinking about the artifactual nature of protests, I think, was uh, an interesting conversation there. And then the last one, I'm going to put my friend on the spot here, because we have a gentleman from Australia. So talking about international contexts, uh, we actually have another democracy represented in the room. And uh, we were talking a little bit about how activism and democracy intersect uh, in Australia now, particularly in the wake of the shooting that happened in New Zealand and some of the things that have been going on there. So I'm going to um, get him up here to t say a few words for us when we get to that point, too. Okay. I'd like to pick up, if I could, on the artifactual thing. Uh, my current obsession is actually an area where citizen activism is creating incredible change all over the country, which is gerrymandering, election districting. And an amazing young woman named Katie Faye in Michigan woke up the day after the 2016 election and decided she was looking at how her congressional delegation had turned out, and it didn't seem right to her. And she just posted on Facebook, I'm going to do something about gerrymandering. Who's with me? And she went to work. And by the time she came back that night, she had like 10,000 likes. She ended up getting 400,000 signatures for a ballot initiative to overturn um, politician-driven redistricting and won a referendum. But to your point, the key item that became the symbol of that was a quilt that she and a few of the women who started this movement out did that had all the crazy shapes of the Michigan. And that became the emblem, the symbol of the movement. Well, um, you've picked him out. Should we get the gentleman from Australia up here first to fill the seat? If that's okay? Come on down. <laughs> A round of applause for our brave first. Right Observation, question, funny story, whatever you want. Well, earlier we were just speaking about the role of activism in democracy and uh, we had an interesting conversation down there because I am actually a new student who just came into Villanova this semester. So I've been here about two months and uh, <laughs> I come from Australia and um, in Australia in the past five years, we've had five different prime ministers. So the government's been quite unstable changing all the time. So it's been a bit difficult to make some progress on um, environmental issues, climate change, and we've had some powerful politicians um, in the government that don't believe in climate change, and so they don't really support environmental activism and all that. Um, <clears throat> but um, also we spoke about um, this uh, particular powerful politician by the name of Fraser Anning, and um, he uh, recently blamed the uh, terrorist attack that occurred in New Zealand um, that happened in a mosque. And um, you might have heard that um, a terrorist killed about uh, 50 people. And uh, this politician blamed uh, this terrorist attack on uh, Islam and that he claimed that the terrorist was um, motivated by Islam and all. And so he blamed Muslims for all this. And um, as it turned out, there were about a million people who petitioned, a million Australians petitioned to get this politician out of parliament. 
um, recently. I'm not sure if action has been taken on that, but um, that's where they're at right now. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Any thoughts or reactions to that? Yeah, I, I want to thank you for coming up and speaking Truth to Power. Uh, I was just in England over the weekend, um, the London Book Fair, and I met many Australians there uh, as well as other Americans and people from all over the world, and we were talking about the rise of authoritarianism and what is the moral imperative that we all have when we see a global phenomenon of authoritarianism um, and very similar themes and patterns that we're seeing in each of our countries um, and what is it that we can do globally for solidarity for each other's movements. And so I met a woman from Poland who said, you know, I know you're dealing with your own people here who are problematic, your own bombastic tweeters, but I am also dealing with some really intense issues in Poland and we don't have the same sort of media reach and connection. What can you do on social media to help raise awareness about what's happening with women in Poland? And some Australians who were talking about how um, conversations about even things like gun control are also happening in Australia, but people here are talking about them um, only singularly as American issues. And so I'm really interested in how we can build globally because I see patterns between the Erdogans of the world with the Trumps of the world. And, you know, there's Hungary has just banned gender studies. Um, that gender studies is now illegal, a course that I teach <laughs> at the John Jay School of Criminal Justice, right? That deemed here in the criminal justice school, I can teach gender studies, but now it is illegal to teach that about an entire population um, that makes it possible for us to persist as humanity is now um, illegal to teach in Hungary. So I'm really interested in how we can build on each other's movements and what does it mean um, to promote democracy in general. Um, and I guess just one question I would leave with is, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, which is a whole other conversation for another time, um, and learned a great deal in that context about what is possible in an authoritarian state and what is not. Um, and it has informed my activism a great deal. And one of the questions that we had in this sort of global conversation was that people said, how was it possible for Jamal Khashoggi, a US resident, to be killed in another consular space in another country um, and that the world didn't have outrage about that, that things just kind of went on as normal, that we have normal, normalized authoritarianism. And so that's the question I have also been leaning into about what do we do when the shock and awe strategy of authoritarianism is so much that we've been stunned into numbness. Um, and I don't know what to do about that, but I think it's something that we should all deeply think about and act upon. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chair's empty. Does any, I, I do have a question that I can ask as someone decides what is going to drive them up to the chair. But the French Revolution was mentioned, and that's a classic historical example of a movement, a revolutionary and liberating movement devouring itself. Um, and that's one of the dangers that history teaches. I have been like, I guess the word is appalled watching what has happened um, to the Women's March and the splintering and the schisms and it's breaking down over race, over class, over anti-Semitism. You know, 2017, it was spontaneous. It was magnificent and impactful and now it looks like every other squabbling entity in our country. Um, what thoughts do you have about, or what advice do you have for activists to keep um, the French Revolution kind of an extreme example, but how, you know, and essentially the Women's March in many ways, if you know history, is reacting, is reenacting the suffragette movement and its relationship with reconstruction and the struggle for African-American liberation in the 19th century. We're just doing it all over again. It's crazy making. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about that. Yeah, well, not about the French Revolution yeah. per se, but um, your, your comments made me think about, um, I had an interview with David Hornbeck, who is a former superintendent no, of the well, Philadelphia yeah. Public School District. Um, and I asked him about um, his approach to the superintendency and any of his regrets. And he 
He invested a lot in community organizers, especially parent organizing groups and activism as a, as a way to um, enhance public education in the city. And he regretted that strategy of investing in parent organizing groups because they started to get very territorial. They started to splinter, as you said. And he said, I wish I had invested in the youth organizers. Mm -hmm. um, and those youth organizing groups that had developed um, 25 years ago are still going strong today, and they are seen as national models, the, the Philadelphia Student Union, Youth United for Change, um, Juntos. These are very powerful youth-led organizing groups that have learned to build coalitions, to work together, to um, carve out their kind of geographic spaces, but to come together around the, the issues. And so I think there's something about young people and youth that I'm very optimistic about. And I see it with the Parkland kids. Um, they received a lot of criticism early on and they learned and adapted and they shared their stage, they shared their platform, they lifted up the voices of youth who have long been um, crying out about gun violence in their communities. And they're building this very powerful movement. So I think um, I think there are these, these tensions, but I think young people are learning um, from them and they are adapting in ways that give me hope that they'll be able to sustain these movements without um, the fractures. I would say also your example of the Women's March as uh, being largely a spontaneous um, organization, it's also partly speaking to the difference between organizations and institutions, right? So part of the spontaneity of it, which made it um, you know, so exciting also perhaps contributes to why it can be hard to sustain, right? People don't have the um, ability to mobilize resources that they might have in a more established institution, which isn't to say that institutions um, also don't have their own splintering and fracturing and, and arguments, but perhaps the institution can survive those things because, um, you know, it's been around longer, it has more resources and so forth. I'm thinking, um, for example, I think conservative activists, we mostly talked about liberal activists, but conservative activists actually do a, a great job of uh, institution building, I think, and um, re regardless of what their particular um, issues are, um, focus on developing the institutions as institutions often, um, in addition to the particular issues, whereas sometimes some of the more liberal organizations that are um, founded more quickly maybe don't have this institutional background of, uh, of years of of, of experience and also resources that they pour into this to develop often a national model that sort of branches out. Um, I'm thinking perhaps of like um, the Federalist Society, for example, it's not really that old, but it's been uh, very effective at uh, developing a strategy. It's far more resource than a lot of newer um, sort of liberal organizations, which is really important. And uh, although there is of course diversity in conservative activists, it, it's a largely homogeneous sort of group. Um, and a, an elite group, but uh, I think this question of institution building is really important and some of the more successful uh, movements, that, uh, the civil rights movement that I mentioned before, leaned not only on new organizations like say SNCC, but developed these also from longer standing institutions, um, churches, schools, the NAACP and so forth that had been around for a long time. Yeah, so Great. the Women's March, I know that very intimately because mm -hmm. I wrote the oral history for the Women's March. Cool. So. Um, there was a book that came out called Together We Rise uh, that was came out last year at the anniversary of the march, and I interviewed all, a lot of the lead activists um, globally who organized the march, and you know told the real story of what happened. And there's a lot that's happened since then, but I, I still followed it very closely. And one of the things that comes to mind for me is the question that I think I think about a lot with movements, which is, does every movement need to turn into a 501c3 nonprofit <laughs> organization? <laughs> kind of kind of what you're talking about, that I think because of the structures of capitalism, neoliberalism, all of those things, that we feel like if we want to bottle the momentum of a movement um, to keep it strong, that we have to institutionalize it in that way. But what does it mean to, that sometimes maybe something that happened needs to be let go in a peaceful hospice of a way <laughs> that it becomes something new or that it can turn into a different transition and form versus it having to be codified as a 501c3 tax status exempt nonprofit organization that might not be the right container for the kind of movement that emerged, right? And so I won't editorialize about my thoughts directly about that, but I think that that's a question I have about the Women's March and certain other things too about the Women's March is that 
when I look at what happened, I had some people who I'm close to who were close to it saying, you know, what, what happened? What did we do? And I said, well, if you look at the Black Panther Party for self-defense and you look at all of the great programs that the Black Panther Party um, set up around sickle cell anemia and bringing acupuncture to communities in Oakland and all of the things you never hear about, um, breakfast programs, um, a lot of what you hear about at the end was the destruction that happened based on several personalities, that several egos, um, the destruction that happens based on all of the social ills and systemic inequalities that show up and hurt people hurting other people, that led to it becoming a fractured organization as well at that time and having to regenerate itself later on. And so that's why I think the conversation about history is so important because if we look at what's happening with the Women's March now, if we look at what happened to former movements, you see all of the same conversations about what happens when the media props up certain personalities above others, um, what happens when the media centers certain agendas above others, what happens when Pro happened, and now what happens when Facebook surveils and um, profiles communities of color and turns that information over to law enforcement unjustly. So I think connecting those dots it's really important, and I think that the Women's March, I think, is scrutinized unfairly in some ways because it's women. So, you know, I have a point of view about that, but also because it was a de decentralized movement. Because if you look at Black Lives Matter, if you look at any of these modern movements that have kind of spiked up, you see the same heart of it, which is why what I'm trying to guide myself by now is um, kind of the similar coalition points that that you spoke about, which is the Black Lives Matter mantra that Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi and Patrice Cullors designed, which is that we should be low ego, high impact, and move at the speed of trust. And if we have those things, then we can build movements together. Wow, that's great, thank you. Uh, I can see that the chair thing isn't working, so you can raise your hand <laughs> and ask a question or make a comment. Yeah, we have a mic too, so wait for the mic. So we talked a lot about the idea that, like, are we currently going through a peak of college activism? Um, and it was interesting because I guess I've never thought of it that way, even though through my time here, I mentioned freshman year. I remember we had a Black Lives Matter movement. Sophomore year, we had a Parkland movement. And just last Friday, we had the climate change movement. So I thought it was funny that I've never really thought about it like that, even though, like, administrators and adults feel like we are going through that. Um, and I think that has to do with a lot of the fact that growing up on social media, I hear a lot of comments, I'll see tweets of like, that would be an activist sentiment of somebody I know who is not going to turn out at a protest. And so I feel like there's sort of a contradiction between like, you might tweet about it, but are you going to go to a sit-in? Probably not. So I think that I just wonder what's going to happen when Twitter or Facebook eventually potentially fizzle out or people who are now tweeting when they have their careers and they're not really active as much, where are those social movements gonna go? Or does that even count as activism? Yeah, so slacktivism, what do you all think about that? Well, the, the college students who identify as activists that I studied um, with Hua and some other students on campus, um, talk about the idea that they, when they became activists, there was no one trigger moment, right? There was no kind of straw that broke that made them activists. It's very difficult for them to tell their story of how and when they became activists, um, but it was, it always involves some active experimentation, some dipping their toes into the waters. And sometimes that happens on social media, exposing yourself. Sometimes it happens just by showing up to a protest and talking to some people. Um, and they won't say, you know, I'm trying out the activist identity, um, but once they're fully committed to that identity and they're moving forward with it, they look back and they say, yeah, you know, I, I did some things that seeded um, my development as an activist. Um, so, so I don't think any of the activists in our state, they're very dismissive of slacktivists. Um, they, they were frustrated by that. They wanted people to, to turn up and turn out. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't dismiss it because I think it's maybe the beginning of an activist career starting. Um, and then I also uh, think, as I said before, I'm very optimistic about these younger generations. I um, saw there was a, a climate uh, strike at my daughter's elementary school um, for students but they had signs, they came in prepared. Um, and I think you know, a lot of students are kind of growing up 
with this culture now. Um, we'll see if it sustains, but I think younger and younger students are getting involved in movements. Um, there's a scholar named Robert Rhodes who studied activists in the 1990s, and he posited that um, activism on college campuses came in these waves of every 30 years, and it was due to the, the progeny of former activists taking up the mantle. Um, but, but this moment is five years too early for that hypothesis, right? So I think as we're looking at college student activism, youth organizing in middle schools and high schools, we're starting to see um, it happening at earlier ages, and hopefully that means it will sustain. I think it's because my generation screwed things up so badly they can't wait another five years. No, they can't with climate change. Yeah, yeah so I think I love what you're talking about because I, I really think that you know, some of us just show up in different ways. You know, I believe in working with people's strengths. And maybe it is kind of like the evangelical upbringing and being like, oh, everyone I can put to work and help me, like on my church initiative or something like that. Like I can recruit everyone. Um, that has kind of, you know, colored how I see these things. But I'm always kind of like, oh, if a person's the deep introvert who's not going to be at the rally, that's the person I'm going to say, can you provide childcare? for some of the people who need to show up or, you know, I had eye surgery over the summer and I had so much fear of missing out from the rallies because I love a good protest. And I was just like, what am I gonna do with myself? And people said, can you order pizzas and get these delivered for people to be doing these sit-ins um, over the Kavanaugh hearings? And so, you know, there's those kinds of things that people might think aren't activism because they're the, the less, attractive thing, but those things can really help keep a movement going. The pizza is extremely important when people need to be fueled in a sit-in. <laughs> and it sounds like I'm just, you know, being petty with this, but it's, it's really true. Um, and so I think it's really about some of my friends in the Resistance Revival Chorus will go and sing. They were singing to people who were incarcerated during um, the Families Needing to Stay Together campaign, the Families Belong Together campaign, and just going and singing and bringing joy to people and saying, we see your humanity. And one that was bringing media, but also kind of just showing joyful defiance. So I think that um, what I think of a lot when I see people who are apathetic is they haven't found their strength yet to how they can show up. And it's up to those of us who are energized to do the activism to try to engage them in more creative ways. Chris, do you mind if I interject you, sir, real quick? Because I, I just didn't want to forget this thought. We actually um, did a podcast series on 1968 uh, last semester, and we did a, a really great interview with a scholar here at Villanova, uh, actually talking about uh, what happened in Mexico City in 1968 and the protests and the massacre by the government um, in October 1968. And he made this really great point, which I'm going to paraphrase, so I encourage you to listen to the podcast to get it more correctly and succinctly, because he put it quite well. But during that movement of student protests in the 1968 uh, Mexico City, there was a lot of invisible and hidden labor that went into making that possible. There were the students in the square the night of the massacre on October 4th, but in the summer leading up to it, there had been people walking the streets, handing out flyers, getting information to people, serving as sort of a social media before there was social media, spreading things through the network. And a lot of those uh, people were women. And so I think what historians can do to get to this question about media and how it trumpets personalities, in the current moment, media might surface one or two people as sort of being the face, the person who's out there on the front lines, the person holding the sign. Historians have the opportunity to come in after the fact and do more digging in the sources and get to some of those hidden and invisible faces, the ones that may be doing small things on the side that may not wind up on the front page of the New York Times or as the top trending thing on Twitter. And I think that's, if I can make the plug for the value of history in this conversation, history can fill in those hidden gaps and it can show us where those people have been sort of left out of the story. And sometimes they may not even be in the sources. And so that requires us to then have to read against the grain of the sources and do things like oral history and other things to track down uh, these elements of the truth. Um, but uh, I encourage you to listen to that podcast. It's on our website, and um, it's uh, episode number five. <laughs> we have another hand up there. Yeah, okay. um, our group talked a little bit about past activist movements and the uh, positive results that they 
produced. Um, the, the favorite is certainly the almost 100 years of uh, movement organizing for uh, women's right to vote, which we will celebrate next year in the United States. Similarly, many decades uh, against equal, equally uh, adamant resistance in Great Britain to get women the right to vote. We almost we, we usually forget that prohibition have we had prohibition thanks to uh, an activist movement that that went on for several decades. Uh, so sometimes activism produces results that you like and maybe sometimes uh, ones that later fall out of fashion uh, as time passes. But since we are at the LePage Center for History in the Public Interest, I think the, uh, the historical record contains more examples of successful activism, activism that produced lasting results than the opposite. And even if you look at major modern revolutions, whether it's the Chinese Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution, which certainly had some unfortunate consequences, uh, to evaluate the, it, it's, I think, a useful exercise to evaluate the kinds of lasting changes that say the French Revolution made in law, or the Russian Revolution made in art, or uh, the Chinese Revolution made in ending foot binding. So uh, activism's history is a really, really uplifting one in my view. I would say also though that a lot of people probably are more inspired to write about the more lasting you know, movements and effects of activism than the ones that weren't as successful. I mean, I'm sure some people, and I can think of some examples of people who have written about things that were unsuccessful or maybe only partially successful, um, but it's also hard to know as much about the things that were unsuccessful or more fleeting than the ones that were um, more successful, I think. Hi. My name's Yvonne. I'm a student activist at Villanova. I mean, more of a student organizer. Um, I just like the distinction between activism and organize. I would like that to be uh, defined because I think activism is sort of self-righteous at times versus organizing, which is doing that paper flying before booking a room, doing all the nitty gritty stuff that, you know, a lot of invisible labor is, you know, being used. And so if y'all could talk about that. And also, Natalie, I also came up to you um, at the beginning about um, like what is a movement? I think it's being redefined. I'm in a nonviolence in America course right now and we talk a lot about the civil rights movement. And now like with social media, um, a movement either is being redefined, like how we define it or how we, what we want from movements, how we view movements now that we have like social media. Do you, I'm saying a lot of things, but like, does it make sense? Like social media has impacted the way we have movements because even though we have TV, like it was different during the civil rights movement. How many channels were there compared to now? How, how many news outlets were there compared to now? There's just so much information, misinformation. I just said two different questions. So. We'll do the first one, then the second one. Great. <laughs> Okay, so the first one was defin versus defining organizing versus, versus activism. Or, or, yeah, I mean, so that's hard, right? Organizing doesn't necessarily have to have any political purpose at all, right? So activism has to have some kind of um, some kind of goal, right? It could be a some kind of change that you want to make, right? It could be a political goal. It could be um, consumer activism. You want some product to be safer. You know, there there has to be some kind of specific. Um, effect or reform that you uh, want to engage in. Organizing could support that activist um, effort, right? It could be organizing for a particular activist cause, but you could also like organize for your social club that doesn't necessarily have any kind of um, particular political or other activist effect, right? So, I mean, organizing is sort of this um, behavior you might engage in for uh, the purpose of the activism, but you could also do it for other things. 
Yeah, I, um, I see organizing as kind of under the umbrella of activism, and I, I think of the Saul Alinsky, you know, model of organizing. There, there are other um, types of organizing models, but I see that as being a very specific approach to gathering a community together, building their relationships, understanding what their needs are, and then helping them to, um, to articulate and, and those, translate those needs into demands and do a power analysis and figure out who's the right uh, target for those demands and then to um, put the, apply the pressure. Um, the, the students in our study did not all have the same definition of activism, even though they all identified as activists, but their definitions coalesced around themes, and the themes were that they were taking action, they were doing something more than just going on social media, they were taking action in the real world to affect change in an oppressive or unjust set of conditions, or to, to change an unjust status quo. Um, and so that was their, their understanding in general of what activism was, but Hua will back me up. About a, a third of our participants describe themselves as uncomfortable activists, in part because of that, um, that not the, not the um, self-aggrandizing piece that you mentioned, Yvonne, but because they felt that they hadn't done enough yet to uh, warrant the title of activist, that they thought of an activist as uh, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or somebody who, who's really you know, steeped in this, deep in it, and they were on their way, but they weren't there yet. And so they felt this, this discomfort um, with the title activism, which I thought was interesting, even though they kind of opted in to describe themselves as activists in the study. Can I ask you a question about your question? Okay, well, um, and Jerusha's term self-aggrandizing is sort of where I was going. I thought I heard in your question a kind of notion that to you an activist is the, an organizer is the person who does all the work to make sure the public action takes place, and then the activists show up and say, where's the camera, or what, what can I chant? Is that sort of what's going on in the distinction you were looking at? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, exactly. Um, I, in my view, and it could be different for everyone, and that's completely fine. Organizers are the ones behind the scenes, and activists are the ones who show up. And I also feel like activism has, has been, like, um, kept away from just everyday people because they feel like they have to have certain exactly what you were just saying, like have certain outcomes in order to be an activist. Does it make sense? Like our capitalist society is telling us like we can't be something unless we produce, produce, produce. You just can't be like an artist unless you're making money. You can't be uh, an activist unless you're making results. I just wish that wasn't the case. Does it make sense? Okay. I am a bear of very little brain. I can't remember what your second question was anymore. My second question is in in this age of social media, how are movements redefined, um, especially with with so much uh, news that is going out now that we are numbed to all of this, right? Um, I mean, there are many different answers. Are, are, are you asking, the, is it, I'm asking questions about your questions again. <laughs> are you suggesting that it's too easy to call something a movement now so that the term is devalued? Or is that what you're getting at? Well, I guess... Um, I was one out of two, and I understand. <laughs> okay, so I, in my courses this semester, we've been talking a lot about movements, and um, one of the discussions is that Me Too isn't actually a movement because there are no... Like, we don't really know their demands other than lessening the... Uh, abuses that women go through, you know, what are the, like, unlike the civil rights movement where we had much more tangible goals, um, obviously there's a presence online, but is that a movement? Like, who are the people behind it? And is there unity? Is there solidarity? You okay, know, we got it. Well, they're eager to answer. Yes. So, so, so here's what I think, and, you know, I'm going to be like a rapper right now and shamelessly plug my book, Roadmap for Revolutionaries, Resistance and Advocacy for All. And I wrote this with two other women, Carolyn Giron and Elisa Camahort Page. And it was kind of our response to 11-9-2016. And after we got out of the fetal position, 
we decided what could we do with the strengths that we have and let's write a scout sort of handbook for how people can take action, activism or organizing in any way that they're interested from, you know, if you want to do a lobby day to if you want to um, learn more about how you can do something like Standing Rock activism and help support Standing Rock and indigenous um, work. And when we were doing that together, we also had to ask the, ourselves the question about what is the role of social media? Should it be separated from how we talk about grassroots movement tactics, canvassing, phone banking, those kinds of things? And so I, one, would urge you to just check out our book. It's at the library, too, so I'm not going to make this like an ethical consumption capitalism thing. If You know, you can, I'd love for you to buy it. But um, also, you know, get the book in any way that you can because it says very much what I believe, which is that digital activism is important because it is... Um, about using the tools to shift culture, to shift hearts and minds. But there's also a peril that we have to think about, which is the fact that who controls the tools? How are tools used to um, police communities who are already in peril? Um, all of those things are also a part of how social media um, becomes a really complicated um, sort of movement tool and also movement hindrance. And so. For me, I do believe that social media should be a part of our movements now because it is just a tool, just like flyering or canvassing. It can allow us to have megaphones that we never had before while also remembering that we have to practice digital safety. And so we kind of talk about this in the book too. How do you protect yourself as an ac activist or an advocate or an organizer? How do you make sure that you put yourself in less Harm, less of harms of way around surveillance um, for you and your communities and all of those things. Um, also, as it relates to social media, I just wanted to say that there were some major movements like the Arab Spring that really exemplified why social media is so important as it relates to helping to elevate the voices of people who would otherwise be suppressed by governments. There was a man in Egypt um, who was in Tahrir Square who named his daughter Facebook because of the power of Facebook that he said, my daughter's name is Facebook because I wouldn't have known about this uprising that changed our country if it hadn't been for that. And so we talk about that in the book as well. Um, I think that what social media also provides is an opportunity for us to um, make that pseudo-democracy better because it isn't one yet, right? So we can also put pressure on Jack at Twitter, on Mark at Facebook. Listen to the names of the people I'm telling you about too. Notice their monochromatic demographic. <laughs> and also make sure that we also get our representation in those companies and also um, make those platforms more just because the tools, the problem we have with those right now is that the tools aren't agnostic. The tools, just like every other tool and institution we have in the society, are also colored by the people who build them. They impact the way those tools are run, how moderation is done, and who is surveilled, and who is uplifted. And so when we have algorithmic inequality, that also impacts our movements. So I would like to invite us to think about social media as not separate from our movements, but how can we make it work for us, and also how can we make it better for us by holding those platforms accountable. Okay, um, I just want to make a comment that we've entered the economics of scarcity. We have time for two more comments. You mentioned that conservative activist groups have been really good about developing um, structures like the Federalist, and I'm curious as to your opinion as the issues with some of the liberal schools or students who come out and don't allow comfortably some of the more conservative activists to speak on their campuses. I might disagree with what those conservatives have to say, but I have felt it was really strange. I think there was an issue here at Villanova. I think there was an issue at Haverford. There have been issues at universities out in California where there were programs set up that a conservative speaker was going to come in. And I've wondered, is it because liberals, we's, we're afraid to have somebody come in? I, what's, I don't understand why we're not. Well, I'm not afraid, but <laughs> um, I think, well, some of these students have different sorts of claims, right? There's different, there have been a, diff a number of different 
um, speakers, some of whom I think are perhaps uh, more like intellectual or academic than others. And so there are sort of different uh, degrees of complaint that I think different students have. And also I think some of them um, have objected to the use of like student fees or particular kinds of funding so that they're effectively paying for some of these um, speakers. I, we haven't talked about any specific examples. I don't know who the person was at Villanova, if there was someone specific here. Um, I, th I mean, people talk about the sort of the marketplace of ideas. I think more speech should be encouraged. I don't really think that there is a climate, though, of uh, liberal students going around um, forcing conservative speakers to stop speaking as much as there is the opposite way, um, particularly with uh, professors who aren't tenured at some universities. Um, so without going into detail, detail about these specific uh, speakers that you might have in mind, I'm not really sure how exactly to answer. Um, but I think, I mean, there is like perhaps a legitimate grievance a student might have about having to fund uh, an event of someone who like um, makes particularly virulent comments about a group that they may be a part of. Uh, whether that should be enough to shut down the event, I, I don't really know. Um, so I'll just, I'll make that sort of general statement uh, in response. And I can say, when you spoke about California, you're probably talking about Milo Yiannopoulos. And, you know, I consider his speech hate speech. And so I also think that the distinction, so I think that a lot of, like, the right-wing extremists, and I'm making a distinction between that than, like, conservatives, um, have done a really good job of saying that they are being silenced. You know, it's kind of like corporate, corporate personhood, right? Like, I think it's the same way that they're like, I have been oppressed and victimized. It's not okay to be white. You know, they had a hashtag, like, it's okay to be white. And I just thought, this is so ridiculous. It is so extra that, like, the fragility that they felt that just because, you know, there's a movement called Black Lives Matter, you know, that, like, they were just kind of missing the point. Like, if Black Lives Mattered, we wouldn't have to say Black Lives Matter, right? And so I think that, a lot of those movements that students have had on these different campuses have specifically, most of that force has been around people like Milo who actively use the flank of their supporters online to dox people, which means like, you know, getting people to stalk people online, putting their documentation up. Um, you know, he personally, you know, sent droves of people to attack people that I really care about. Or Steve Bannon, an organization I used to work at, he called us like, um, expletive, like, expletives from Seven Sisters schools, terrorists, or something like that, which I, you know, at the time I just thought, wow, that's rich, but his sort of incendiary speech has inspired people to be violent, um, and I think after Charlottesville, there's been a more concentrated effort of student activism to prevent these kind of speakers on campus, because we're now renegotiating what is the difference between protected speech and what is hateful speech that is akin to yelling fire in a movie theater, right? So I think that that's the question we're trying to examine right now. And my position on it is that I am interested in talking to people who think differently from me because it helps me, one, affirm my viewpoints and values, and then sometimes occasionally change my mind or expand. But I also do believe that um, as we've seen in New Zealand and in Charlottesville, that hate speech is deadly and that there needs to be a moral movement against it. If I might ask you a question, that sounds exactly right to me, but again, I'm sort of back to the question of appropriation. How do you feel of when, you know, if you, you articulated a clear, not objective, but not purely subjective standard. But I think part of what you're talking about is a fear that we're getting to a point where a student says, this is upsetting to me. I'm this kind of person, and they're saying things that are upsetting to me, so I don't want them coming to my campus. So it's the appropriation of what is entirely, you know, appropriate when it comes to Milo or Mike Cernovich or any of these jackasses. But, Preach. Yeah. But, <laughs> It could also, that same move can be applied to people who are simply conservative intellectuals. So how do we avoid that happening? I mean, what I'll quickly say about it is that, you know, um, I think it's important to have the dialogue about the dialogue, right? And talk about like what is triggering and why and what kind of supports we can have for people and like what is violent speech that can cause damage and that is irreparable. And, and I think that those are the conversations that campuses should have um, versus sort of like the extreme reactions on many sides of this around saying like, we're not gonna have conversations at all 
or, oh, you're just fragile because... So that, that's a way to nurture activism, but by making distinctions about what activism is effective and what might be less effective. Exactly, and just to have... I think to have those conversations without shaming people about content that is um, sensitive to them, because I think that that happens to women a lot. Um, I've seen it in my own classes when talking about Me Too and are talking about survivorship, and people don't kind of know what people are showing up with in the room. But you know what I'll say too is, I will rightfully defend someone's right to be wrong if I don't think that they are creating um, damage and harm. Um, and then there are people who I do think are incendiary. So for example, I debated Tommy Lauren several years ago. I will never get that time in my life back. <laughs> but I still felt like it was a valuable experience for me to do that, to have a counter speech to the drivel that was coming out of her mouth. And I will hold firm to that. And it was worth the trolls and all of those things. But I also know that there were other people in my life who were very bothered by it and said, you know, why would you even give her a platform from which to speak? And I think that if I'd known what I do now about like the level and depths of her problematicness, I probably would not have. And so I think that it's worth having those conversations too about how speech does matter and it does have an impact and that giving people a platform can have potential damaging effects. The complicating thing is in actually encountering her and resisting her, you may have, okay. yeah, you may have diffused her, but if she's left alone to speak to her, you know, her group, then it's complicated. It's really We're not besties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're done. Thank you so much. Can we give our panel a round of applause? So we, we are nearing 8 o'clock, and um, I'm assuming that there are other things you want to get done this evening, aside from sit here and engage in this dialogue with us. So we will uh, wrap it up very shortly. Um, it's, uh, there's been a lot of interesting things that have come out tonight. I think one of the things that has come out, which was raised in the question and, and also came up in some of our groups, is this question of, well, sort of there's activism, and like, what, what's the opposite of activism? Like, what is the what is the... You know, is it organizing? Is it is it is it just being a sort of everyday, which I heard came up a lot, this idea of just the everyday. Um, and so Paul and I actually were batting that idea around between you know uh, between ourselves uh, earlier this semester, and that's actually going to be the topic of the next conversation we have in this series. So uh, in two weeks, on April 9th, we're going to talk about the power of everyday life, right? So how how do we participate in democracy? In, through the regular course of actions that we do, whether it's, it's the food that we buy at the grocery store, uh, the place where we buy our coffee, uh, you know, paying taxes, supporting our local library, going to the PTA meeting. Uh, there are lots of other ways that we participate in democracy as a side, apart from being the person on camera who's getting the headlines about being in Washington, D.C. with the sign. Uh, so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to really focus on it from a historical perspective with three excellent historians, including our very own Paul Steggy. So I hope you'll join us on April 9th. It's a Tuesday night back here in this room for that conversation. Chris will be back to moderate. And we're going to continue experimenting with this unpanel format. Um, so one thing that you all can do in a form of participation with us is we're going to send out a survey probably next week or the week after to get your feedback on this format. Did it work for you? Uh, did you enjoy it? Uh, would you have preferred just to have a, a more traditional type of panel? Uh, that'll help inform our programming moving forward um, if we want to keep doing events like this or if we want to revert back to some of the more traditional style events that we've done in the past. So I think those are all the obligatory announcements. Please join me in thanking our panelists and Chris again. Thank you.